<laughs> Members, good evening. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Uh, members, I have one apology from Councillor Donovan. Um, members will be receiving updates tonight on COVID-19, so I'll seek a mover of a motion to suspend formal proceedings for sufficient time to enable uh, presentations. Thank you. I have Councillor Abraham today, seconded Councillor Martin. Uh, members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Thank you. Um, Firstly, if I could just uh, thank the Premier for joining us tonight and making time to come and give us an update on uh, what's happening. If I can also thank members for responding so quickly to the calling of the special meeting. I think uh, without underestimating or underplaying anything, there are very unique circumstances and things are moving very, very quickly. Um, it gives us an opportunity to work together to address uh, concerns and also provide assurances as well as actions. So I look forward to the briefings tonight. Um, in terms of daily, so there's a series of meetings that are in place um, and I'll be providing daily updates around five o'clock every day to all members. Um, I'll also be posting messages for the public arrest on some businesses um, and I encourage you to share any of the online uh, digital media channels that come out of that. But there will be communications uh, from myself and the CEO every day around five o'clock. Um, in the meantime, um, I have been in communication with the uh, capital city Lord Mayors um, so that we are across what's happening around the country. And also uh, the mayors of the 40 countries that I'm doing the Bloomberg with. And that's been really interesting to see what's happening uh, both in Europe and all three of the states. Um, so we'll come back to a few things at the end of the presentations, but I will actually hand over to the Premier to uh, give us an update. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor, councillors and others that are in this room. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to address this special uh, council meeting. We are unequivocally in uh, extraordinary times at the moment with the global pandemic of the coronavirus and we are not going to be immune in Australia and we're certainly not going to be immune in South Australia and I thought this would be a useful opportunity to provide a bit of an overview of what the current situation is, uh, the mechanisms that have been put in place to manage the spread of the coronavirus and what the likely things are that are going to come down the track and then if there are any specific questions I'm more than happy to uh, answer them to the best of my ability. It's quite possible that Dr Mike Cusack, who's the Acting Chief Medical Officer in South Australia and soon to be appointed Deputy Chief Public Health Officer in South Australia could uh, join us but he is finishing off a webinar that we've just had with um, school principals and directors of early childhood um, ed education facilities, kindies um, uh, and the like across South Australia. So. It's fair to say we are absolutely in uncharted territory at the moment. Uh, since the first um, infection of the coronavirus was identified, this is a disease which has moved extraordinarily quickly. In many ways, we're fortunate in Australia that we are several weeks or months behind the front of this disease, and that provides us with a unique opportunity to learn the lessons uh, from those nations which have been dealing with it already, learn the lessons of uh, the practices that have helped to mitigate uh, the spread of the disease. We've also been able to learn from those countries who haven't uh, done it so well. And in Australia, I think today we've handled it extraordinarily well on any uh, global measure. We certainly would like to follow the trajectory of countries uh, like Singapore and not uh, countries uh, like uh, Iran or Italy. Um, this is an issue which we've got to stay uh, on top of and the very best way to do that is to act in a coordinated way across all states. So COAG, which was um, held on Friday, so the Council of Australian uh, Governments met and we uh, decided to establish a national cabinet for the six premiers, the two chief ministers and the prime minister. Uh, that group met again yesterday and we'll meet again tomorrow. Uh, and then again on uh, Friday. 
And this is really important because we really do need to approach this on a national uh, basis so that we don't have one state uh, doing one thing and having a certain response to the spread of the disease, but in another state a completely different response, which will only sort of fuel uh, some of the anxieties that are already uh, coming forward uh, with regards to how we're handling this. Um, the National Cabinet is informed by the AHPPC, which is the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee. Uh, we have a representative on that, that's our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr Nicola Spurrier. And so she, with the other Chief Public Health Officers around the country, are providing that expert advice uh, into the National Cabinet. And they, in turn, are uh, informed by a very dedicated uh, group within the CDNA, which is the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia. And these are the smartest epidemiologists that exist. They're providing expert advice into the Chief Public Health Officers, and they are providing uh, the advice to the National Cabinet. So you should have no uh, concerns that you've got a group of politicians with no medical capability or knowledge making decisions. Uh, we are absolutely being informed by the very best advice that we can possibly get. Um, we have asked the AHPPC to look at four priority areas to advise the National Cabinet on. Uh, the first of these is schooling. Uh, the second is aged care, the third is mass gatherings, and the fourth is the area of remote Indigenous communities. They are four areas of real anxiety or vulnerability, and we would like expert advice before we move as one uh, to put um, our actions into place. It's fair to say that um, in South Australia to date, there has been no evidence whatsoever of what we call community transmission. So this is a transmission of the disease where we can't trace the origin of it. In fact, we have 22, um, 22 uh, com confirmations of people living uh, with uh, coronavirus in South Australia. I think already six or, or more of those people have been discharged. Um, of those 22, 20, we can directly trace to their own overseas travel. The remaining two, one where there was a transmission uh, between members of the family who were in close uh, proximity, and one where somebody had gone interstate uh, and came into contact with somebody who'd been overseas. So we have excellent traceability in South Australia. And in fact, our um, screening of the potential for community transmission is quite possibly the best in the world because since uh, we started testing and since we set up pathology services in South Australia, uh, we were doing um, screening for all people where uh, a respiratory specimen was taken. So this, I mean, until about a week ago, there were more um, tests done in South Australia than the entire US. Uh, that shows you the level of testing that had been put in place by uh, SA Pathology. And that's why we can say with quite a lot of confidence that there is no widespread community transmission. Other people can report that they haven't got evidence of it. We've actually got evidence that we don't have that community transmission. But there is community transmission in other parts of the country. Um, and so I had to make a decision whether uh, we would put the same, um, if you like, restrictions in place in South Australia immediately, uh, whether they were being put in place uh, in other uh, jurisdictions, and that's what I decided to do. We could, quite frankly, have uh, waited uh, several more days, weeks, or potentially uh, more than a month, uh, because we just don't have this widespread transmission that exists. But I decided that if they were going to put these restrictions in place in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, that it would just be too confusing for people and add to this anxiety that is already uh, evident uh, in South Australia. And so really in abundance of caution, we have also acted uh, here uh, in, in South Australia. Now the restrictions that have been put in place uh, to date, um, first of all, the Prime Minister announced on Friday that there was going to be a restriction on all non-essential public gatherings above 500 people from today. And the second thing that was announced was a series of two measures yesterday following the National Cabinet. One was that all inbound passengers coming to Australia would have to submit themselves to self-isolation for two weeks, irrespective of whether they're Australian citizens or foreign nationals. And secondly, that there's an immediate 30-day ban on cruise ships, international cruise ships, uh, docking in Australian uh, ports. So they are the restrictions uh, to date. 
there will be further restrictions. Uh, we are not going to uh, sort of avoid the coronavirus in Australia. It's a global pandemic. Um, but we have uh, four key uh, areas of our state plan, which I think pretty much uh, monitor or mirror what happens in other jurisdictions. But number one is to slow the spread of the disease. Two is to put the resources uh, in place to deal with the projected peak demand uh, for uh, medical services. Number three, to provide high level public awareness and education so that people are informed about what is happening. And fourth, uh, the major economic stimulus, federal and state that have been put in place to make sure that we can maintain as much employment uh, through this year as possible. And so they're the four things uh, that we have uh, as part of our uh, response. Can I say that, um, uh, can I say that, um, we are, are, as I said, acting as one, uh, as a nation, and I think it's been, uh, you know, almost in incredible how much, um, uh, if, you, if you like, um, respect and harmony exists at that National Cabinet at the moment. Uh, we'll meet again tomorrow night. We're likely to consider further restrictions, um, in particular around mass gatherings, and this is probably something which is particularly important to the Adelaide City Council. At the moment, the restriction um, relates to um, the um, non-essential public gatherings above 500. But if we look at countries that are already further down the track than we are, they've made a differentiation between outdoor and indoor and static and non-static. So at the moment, 500 uh, is, the, um, is, the, is the number that has been put in place. The Prime Minister has already specifically said this doesn't affect uh, schools, university, uh, workplaces, uh, or public transport. But that's as of today. Um, as I said, the AHPBC will be providing us with further uh, detailed information that we will work through once that advice uh, is, um, uh, is forthcoming. In some places uh, around the world, they have restricted uh, the numbers indoors to 100. And you might have seen in the US, they've actually dropped that number again uh, to the level that they have in Singapore of 50. And what we're trying to do with these restrictions is to minimise the risk of the um, transmission of the disease. So if people are sitting uh, in a theatre and there are a number of people, uh, for example, that are infected, it's far more likely that you are going to um, contract that uh, infection than if you are just happen to be uh, outdoors with 500 people. And that's why there could be some tightening of those restrictions uh, going forward. I've already spoken to the three vice chancellors in South Australia, work them through the fact of the current restrictions, but then what is happening in other jurisdictions, because I think the more we think about the implications, the better off we're going to be. Yesterday, the Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Wellbeing, Dr. Chris McGowan, spoke with the Minister, Stephen Wade, and we decided that what we would do would be to uh, declare a public health emergency. Now, again, this was discussed uh, at the National Cabinet. Each state has a slightly different uh, terminology for putting in place a framework which will make sure that these restrictions uh, become enforceable. So, um, and that non-compliance with these restrictions will essentially be an offence and we can, then there can be consequences for those offences. So that's the reason we essentially uh, took the powers, the extensive powers that exist under the Public Health Act, and we transferred them to the Emergency Management Act in South Australia. And that gives our Chief, Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Nicholas Furia, much greater ability to move beyond making a, a directive to an individual, to an entire cohort. So if you think about why we would want to do this, it's quite possible. And as I said, Dr. Nicholas Beery at the moment can uh, give a directive to an individual arriving in South Australia or who she suspects could uh, endanger the lives of others by spreading the disease. But what she may need to do in the future is make a directive to an entire cohort, which is currently prohibited under the public health uh, act. So she might want to say, well, we want to put all of these restrictions in place, for example, on the aged care sector, because we know that they're an extraordinarily vulnerable uh, cohort and you couldn't administer that on an individual basis. So she can now make these declarations 
um, and, um, and that is a very helpful thing to do. Again, I emphasise we don't need to do that at the moment, but we're trying to, it's part of our plan, rolling out that plan to get in front of this uh, disease and make sure that we can always uh, remain on the front foot. I've got to say, I'm extraordinarily um, grateful for the excellent work of our Chief Public Health uh, Officer and also the Communicable Diseases um, Control Branch in South Australia, headed up by Dr Louise Flood. Uh, and in fact, all of SA Health. If you think about with some of the things that we've done in South Australia, they have really led the nation, and this has been acknowledged in the national meetings that I'm at. We put legislation through the South Australian Parliament, a difficult organisation, in record time with regards to uh, changing some of the powers under the Public Health uh, Act in South Australia. We, st we immediately stood up on the recommendation of SA Health, standalone rapid testing and assessment clinics uh, in South Australia, we put uh, we, we now have five of those uh, in South Australia, including one of them, which is a drive-through uh, facility, which is really responding to concerns that uh, GPs had in South Australia about the concern that their other patients would have if somebody came in to have a coronavirus uh, test uh, in their surgery. So we said, okay, we'll set up these, if you like, standalone uh, areas and then the drive-through. And we did this in very um, rapid time. And there will be more of those in South Australia. But again, we're listening to the experts as to when and where they should be uh, located. And of course, um, we have got the excellent work that SA Pathology is uh, put in place to do that testing in, in South Australia and the economic stimulus package. There will be more things that we are doing on an ongoing basis. For example, today, uh, we announced that as of today, uh, all of buses, trains and trams in South Australia would be cleaned on a daily basis. So massively increasing the frequency and the scope of that testing. Not that we need it today. And I emphasise that because we don't have evidence of this community transmission, but we've got to get into a different way of thinking in South Australia. We've got to stop shaking hands. We've got to stop kissing our people. We've got to make sure that we have observed really, um, you know, really strict personal uh, hygiene, uh, coughing and sneezing into disposable tissues and then disposing of those tissues, or if you don't have those into the crook of your arm, social distancing is going to become extraordinarily important. We can't be flippant about this uh, because if we get this wrong, lives will be lost. It's as simple as that. And whilst I know people sort of say, look, it's just like a, 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 a bad cold or a bad cough. In fact, eight out of every 10 people will have extraordinarily mild symptoms. It might be like a very mild version of the common cold, but they're not our problem area. Our problem area is the most vulnerable cohorts, uh, people that uh, are uh, aged, people that are fragile for other health uh, related issues, um, people that have got respiratory illnesses, people that are in confined uh, spaces, people that are in prisons, people that are in remote uh, Aboriginal communities. If we play this right, uh, we will be able to minimise uh, the potential damage uh, that those cohorts will experience. If you think about what's happening around the world at the moment, you see some countries where the demand for uh, critical medical supplies massively outstrips uh, the capacity to supply them. And that is why all we're trying to do, because we're not going to avoid it, we're just trying to slow the spread, reduce that demand down and push it as far away as possible so that we can get all of the resources in place. And when I talk about the resources, in particular, I'm talking about intensive care beds, critical care beds, uh, healthcare workers with the requisite skills in South Australia, uh, the requisite ventilation and ECMO capabilities in South Australia. These are the critical things that we need to have in place and we are doing everything we can to get them in place as quickly as possible. And now that we've declared the public health uh, emergency in South Australia, we have even greater powers as a government to requisition all of those things that we need to make sure that we can uh, keep that demand and supply uh, in balance. Soon, I mean, at the moment, people that are, have been diagnosed with living with the coronavirus have been isolated, mainly in public hospitals, but they've certainly been uh, isolated very carefully. Going forward, the numbers uh, that we will have 
uh, people with a diagnosed coronavirus infection will be much greater than our public hospitals can cope with in isolation wards. And this has been the practice um, interstate and overseas, and therefore there would need to be home-based uh, or other methods of isolation because we do need to keep our hospital beds available for those people who are experiencing the highest level uh, impacts of this disease. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we're massively investing at the moment in bringing forward all elective surgery because there will come a time when we just can't do that elective surgery in our hospitals. Um, we are also case managing all people that are in our hospitals that are looking for an aged care bed or an MDIS bed. And it's really important that we shift those people in the next four to six weeks. We are looking at the existing capacity and flexing the capacity and shifting that capacity from general uh, beds to ICU and critical care beds. And in addition to that, um, uh, SA Health has been doing a huge amount of working on how we can take the existing complement of beds in South Australia, 5,500, and even increase that uh, further. And you'll hear more about that uh, into the future. Um, there is not one stone which is being left unturned, uh, unturned at the moment. What we do need to do though is to slow the spread so that we have all of those things in place. And that's why we're, we're, we're wanting people to be calm but not flippant about the likely impacts. If we get this right, we'll be able to avoid uh, the deaths that are being experienced, the unnecessary deaths that are being experienced in other jurisdictions because they've just got that demand and supply uh, out of kilter. So look, I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Mike Cusack is here with us now. He's the Acting Chief Medical Officer in South Australia. And as of tomorrow, I think he'll be appointed as the Deputy uh, Chief uh, Public Health Officer in South Australia. We will be increasing the number of deputies that we have in South Australia to three, because Nicholas Spurrier's work is going to be increasingly split between work in South Australia and work on the AHPBC. And we want her to be there, but we can't neglect the thing, the increase a requirement here in South Australia as well. Again, all of these things have been in our plan now for weeks and weeks, and we're just rolling them out at the appropriate time. Members, uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks very much, and Premier, for your um, presentation and for all that background. I wanted to ask you a few questions about the social and economic impact, if that's okay. Um, one of the issues that's um, been on my right radar, which I've been concerned about, is the impact this is having on people who are of low incomes, in particular people who are experiencing housing stress. And I know that some jurisdictions around the world are looking at rent relief or protection for people that can't afford to pay their rent because they're out of work. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's something that the government has got on its radar and is considering. Look, we're considering all options is the, is the short answer, but what we have already announced is a $350 million immediate stimulus package. We think the very best protection that we can provide for um, people is to keep their job. And there is going to be a lot of stress, especially within the small business sector uh, and casuals to keep their jobs uh, during this period of time. Uh, it is going to be a very messy year. We're not going to avoid this. Our goal is to, to get through it and to come out uh, stronger. Some of the things that we've done within the state uh, jurisdiction is to essentially bring forward any type of expenditure that can get underway in the coming weeks. So the easiest things uh, in that area are things like um, maintenance. So maintenance on housing trust properties. We've put a massive uh, package that we'll be announcing in that area into place straight away. Maintenance on all of our country hospitals. You, look, again, it's great to have those things done. But the major reason why we're doing it is to provide people with work during this uh, particular uh, period. The federal government has already announced $20 billion response. And look, it's not going to be the end of it. A number one priority is the health, safety and welfare uh, of all South Australian citizens. But the number two thing is making sure that we can uh, make sure that we can make, maintain as much employment as we as we possibly can. So um, we put this package out ahead of the state budget, but there'll be other measures, of course, as we learn more about the impacts of this disease. But um, yeah, I think the people of South Australia can be really assured that we have thought through these issues. We're still the only state that has announced a stimulus uh, package. Um, you would have noticed in the paper today that part of that is the PND. Um, um, arrangements. So we're doubling the amount of money that we're putting immediately into that uh, PND uh, grant round, and we're increasing the time that people can put in their applications 
to the 9th of April, but you know we're really not looking to provide um, a lot of stimulus next year or the year after. We're really trying to ask councils to think about if you've got projects that you can get underway that will create employment immediately, these are high priorities uh, for us. So these are, this is, you know, some community sporting things as well. We've already got grant programs out there. We might have had a certain amount of money that we could spend. These were sort of knocked out. We can actually uh, increase that amount of money and open up for more projects if people can demonstrate that we can get on and create employment as soon as possible. One more, just quick question. Um, another issue that's been raised with me is the spike of racism in the city as a result of the coronavirus, mm. um, and you know, people having false perceptions about different people in our community. I wonder whether that's something that is maybe being considered as part of a public health campaign. Well, I, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to probably speak to the communications team. Obviously, the third point of our four-point plan is on high-level public uh, campaign and awareness. Um, that had started, um, if you like, uh, in, a, in a lower level way using social media and using uh, unpaid uh, media. As of Sunday, you would have seen um, that the Sunday Mail had a very extensive uh, coverage. This is all available online as well, not just through the paper, but that is a way of getting it out very quickly to a lot of people. And what you'll see going forward is a very extensive television, um, paper and radio advertising campaign. It's really important that we do this because, um, and, and that we continue it because we really do want to educate the people of South Australia. We want to take them with us. We don't want there to be these, um, we don't want to compound problems uh, with social problems and we certainly don't want people to be panicked. Um, I, I completely understand why people are feeling anxious at the moment and going out and buying lots of groceries. Um, it's completely unnecessary. There is no suggestion whatsoever that supermarkets and grocery stores are going to uh, be closed. And we really do need to have an orderly process for these things because we're going to increase uh, the likelihood of transmission if we act in an, in an unregulated way. <laughs> Thanks. Th thanks very much, Premier, for the detailed uh, background. Um, just to follow up on the, the, the question about the, the concerns about the economic uh, outcomes, um, I, it's um, perhaps fair to say, you know, um, from what I've seen, that the, the, the deepest, broadest fear out there is uh, that of dollars uh, and jobs and being able to simply afford um, to get by within the next week or two is, is kind of that that um, that close to, to people's concerns. Um, is this, given the backdrop, we the federal economic backdrop, uh, we had uh, turmoil in the markets due to, a, to an oil shock um, and we had a response in the markets today whereby there was a plunge uh, despite the announcements of further uh, rate cuts for the monetary policy. Will there be an opportunity at this point for uh, the state government uh, to speak to the federal government about perhaps recalibrating some of their broader economic levers? Um, so, for example, uh, uh, looking at this perhaps this fear of federal deficit spending uh, that has perhaps curtailed uh, the level of infrastructure spending that might be forthcoming uh, and, 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 and maybe recalibrating our reliance on monetary policy uh, given the interest rates uh, issue is, is not working out the way it's meant to be. Will the state government be conducting these sort of deeper, more structural discussions with the federal government to see whether mm. that assistance can come into to fix some of the structural problems that are looming behind this current problem? Mm. Well, I think, look, um, I thank you for your question, but I think that look, that's been pretty much underway and you would have seen the announcements on our announcement on Wednesday, the federal government's announcement on, on Thursday. I mean, they're more than aware of the looming economic problem uh, from the coronavirus. Um, and I think the federal treasurer and our own treasurer have been very clear that our primary focus is on the health, safety and welfare, but our secondary is, is on the economy. I don't think anybody's talking about posting balanced budgets or surplus budgets going forward. So um, I think that we are coming to the useful, at the end of the useful life of monetary policy. Um, Dr. Philip Lowe, who's the governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, has made it really clear um, that there's you know, more than likely going to be a further interest rate cut down to point to a, a, Two five percent uh, as the official interest rate. I'm not sure when the Reserve Bank Board meets again next, but that probably going anything below that is not going to be helpful at all. Uh, there is some work that is already being done um, just around um, uh, you know preparation for three-year bond 
support uh, and trying to take some of the risk out. And I know that there's been media coverage about the potential for QE uh, for the Reserve Bank uh, Board, but um, you know, uh, he has been very clear uh, with the federal government and with the state governments, it's now time for fiscal stimulus. And quite frankly, again, um, South Australia is the poster child. We were the first to act, if you like, uh, the, the announcement that we've made would be like New South Wales putting $1.8 billion stimulus on the table and Victoria putting 1.5. Neither of them have moved at all. And we've done that um, immediately. So he's pretty clear that this is not a time uh, to, um, you know, try to, um, if you like, compensate for the automatic stabilisers which are in our budget. We do not need that to uh, happen at the moment. In fact, what we need to do is to have governments uh, looking at increasing their debt at an historically very low um, cost of that capital, um, locking it in for a long period of, of time, but most importantly to think about um, how we can, if you like, get projects underway straight away, not, you know, pink bats and school halls that might be delivered three years after the actual crisis occurs. And I think we've learned a lot from that uh, GFC. Um, and so I think what we need to do is to put things on the table as quickly as possible. And that is really what the Morrison government has done. So if you think about their, uh, the stimulus package that will be taken to the federal uh, parliament very, very quickly now, um, <clears throat> it deals with small business. So if you think about the balance sheets of our largest businesses and our banks in Australia, they are already extraordinarily strong relative to historic uh, times. Where the fragility in the Australian economy exists is with the small business sector and in particular cash flow. So if the cash flow is affected, people let people go immediately. And that's why um, the federal stimulus, the federal immediate stimulus is $25,000 for small businesses in South Australia, which will really help uh, keeping people uh, employed, the accelerated depreciation of capital items so that people at these times of historic lows will be able to actually go out and borrow money to, if you like, create an order uh, to keep the economy moving. And there are some cash payments, but those cash payments are to really specific cohorts um, because what we're very concerned about, and the Reserve Bank Governor was very clear about this, you've got to be careful with the stimulus that you're not just putting money in people's pockets to pay down their debt and put in the bank for another time because that is not a stimulus. Mm. Uh, and we've got finite resources in, in Australia and so we've got to be very, very careful about how we do spend that money. I I'm, can't speak for the federal government, but I would be flabbergasted if that was the end of the stimulus because um, we've got to make sure that we do come out, we, we, we minimise the effect, if you like, we buffer the effect of the coronavirus on the, South, on the Australian economy and that we can come out of it quicker than other economies. But look, there's, I can't tell you tonight that there is not going to be any pain. I think every person uh, in Australia, unless they've got some magical machine to produce surgical masks, uh, the rest of us are actually going to experience some pain and our job uh, as uh, governments is to really try to work on how we, uh, if you like, deploy our finite resources uh, to minimise the effects that we're going to feel whilst always recognising that our number one priority is making sure that we get those resources in place to cope with the peak uh, demand, health demand that is coming our way. Councillor Canal. Yes, thank you for the presentation, Premier. Um, we've had quite a few meetings today of all, uh, all persuasions, just, uh, just trying to speculate what is it that, you know, particularly the Victoria business, and obviously that's the background I have, um, because each each has a different dynamic, whether you're talking about retailing, where potentially you have to be closed, and, and uh, uh, to manufacturing, where, you know, what happens if someone has a, a problem and, and how, do you, how do you cope with that? Um, and, and also, the, as opposed to the level of leadership, because all, all these things need to be coordinated, and each each sector has a has a completely different uh, issue, uh, but still obviously from the same cause. So, um, how are we able to, uh, I suppose, as a state, work through it with all of the various business uh, associations and groups, uh, so that we start to um, visualise the, each of the different areas that have it, have you know it, the effect. Of we talk about food business, you talk about clothing businesses, and you see already a, a, a nearly a ten percent slump, I think, in the, over the last week in the in the clothing businesses. Um, you know, so that we say, okay, what is what is the solution? What is an assistance? Um, how are we able to uh, bring them through this time? Because uh, the conversation is it's, it's possibly a six week or eight week uh, time frame if we've really good at this. 
um, you know, so that when it does come out the other side, that they are still either there or have already the, uh, the capacities in place to say, okay, this is what we're going to do because obviously you want to get the people back in as fast as possible. Yeah, so look, in addition to the work of the AHPBC and the CDNA, there's another group which is the NCM, which is the National Coordinating Mechanism. And so people from my department, Dr John Gorvet, who's Head of Intergovernmental Relations, and a guy called Will Luca are basically on that. They're dealing with two issues at the moment this week. Uh, the first is uh, food and groceries, and the second is supply chains. But they will be considering other areas as well where we can actually go sector by sector and say, well, what are the implications? How do we keep these sectors um, moving? Look, I, I don't think there's any suggestion whatsoever that there will be changes uh, to arrangements um, for shops uh, to be opening and rationing. I think what we're seeing at the moment is, if you like, a, you know, there's some stresses. Uh, and I think in a couple of weeks that it, things will normalise because people will realise, oh, I didn't need all of those baked beans. Um, I certainly didn't need all that toilet paper, and those two things are not actually interrelated. But uh, that would be the only logic for those two things, uh, quite frankly. But I think it's human nature. There is a little bit of um, anxiety out there, and that should just flow through uh, the system. But we do need to work in a coordinated work way through each of those uh, sectors. Today, I had a meeting with uh, the, the chief of the, the top level uh, CIOs because they've got a really important lead role to play, play to prepare people for a change to the chief information officers um, to uh, play in getting this change work relationship in place. We're going to see more people that are going to be working from home. That's really good because again, it reduces the risk and it shifts that, that curve out. And so we're saying to those people, you need to work out what your business um, your BCP, your business continuity plans are, are going to be. But more importantly, as the largest organisations, you've got very, very large supply chains. You should be working with all of those supply chains about how you're going to use collaboration tools, how people are going to be able to work effectively from home. That put less stress on our public buildings in South Australia. That put less um, uh, pressure uh, on our public transport in South Australia, so that we don't have um, sort of, if you like. We don't exacerbate the problems when we actually uh, hit the peak. I've just spoken with school principals. I'm here now, and I think um, my office has basically got me meeting with as many industry associations as possible. I know that there is one on food um, where there is a, an initial group uh, meeting tomorrow, but then that initial group will then cascade that information out to a broader a group across South Australia. I don't want to suggest we've got all the solutions, but what I do want to really convey today is that we are really rolling out a plan which has existed now for four or six weeks. We're not just reacting to the issue of the day, but we've got to do things in a, in a, in a prioritised way. There will be interruptions, but I've also got this, um, hopefully not a Pollyanna uh, idea, but I do feel that we are good at working in crises together, that we have got the ability to come together and share information. And I hope that what we do, will do this year is not only get through uh, this very, very difficult year, but that we'll actually come out much stronger and more resilient on the other side, and that we will have adopted different work practices, cybersecurity protocols that perhaps don't exist at the moment because people think they're blase and they think uh, it's not really uh, important, but I think that we'll actually, we could potentially, if we handle this correctly, come out much stronger at the other side. And while I'm on um, the issue of cyber security, I do need to let you know that not everybody is playing nicely and there is a massive spike uh, in cyber threats and cyber attacks on data uh, so far this year, um, coincident with the coronavirus. And people really, really need to think about this very, very carefully, especially organisations like the Adelaide City Council. There's a massive, massive spike uh, in phishing exercises where people are getting public information alerts that they are opening and then they're really compromising um, the security of, um, of our digital data. And at a time when there are going to be more people working from home, utilising VPNs, we become significantly more vulnerable. So again, this is one of the reasons why I started with the CIOs, the CTIs and the CISOs today, because they've got a real lead role to play and we can trial things over the next four or six weeks before more significant um, restrictions are put into place. Now, I can't tell you what they're going to be or when they're going to come into place, but as I said, one of the areas 
that um, the um, AH uh, PPC is looking at is mass, mass gatherings. It started with 500 plus. It's likely to shift uh, going forward. I'm very mindful of the Premier's time. So, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Premier. That's very good. And that's eased some of my anxiety. Um, just quickly, uh, talk, touching on the uh, economic stimulus that the federal and state governments are doing, what role do you see is the City of Adelaide and other local government authorities having over and above that, applying for that $25 million in the PND fund? Is now the time that we should be looking at our balance sheet, looking at our debt ratios and, and looking at other ways that we can stimulate the economy? And could there be opportunities for other non-infrastructure projects and partnerships with the state government um, uh, for the duration of the containment phase and then going into recovery as well? Well, I can't really provide advice to the Adelaide City Council, but I can tell you what we're doing in state cabinets. So I've asked all cabinet ministers to look at their budgets and to really think very carefully about how we're spending money. So for, for example, if you take something like the arts portfolio and find the Minister for the Arts, very soon there will be no public performances in South Australia. And so you've got to think to yourself, well, okay, we can whinge and whine and moan and catastrophise about this, or we can say, well, what is the best use of the arts budget for this year in terms of developing product or practice or collaboration or using different technology interfaces, maybe VR, AR, maybe actually doing recordings with the ASO so that they can be sold to create income, maybe doing uh, performances, which is paid for view. We can experiment this year. We can put a lot of effort within our budgets into professional development so that we can improve the capability of the arts sector in terms of running businesses going forward. These are the type of things that we're considering in those areas. We're also considering how we can, in each of our budgets, bring forward expenditure. I think people will reward uh, those governments which bring forward now uh, expenditure. Now, again, I'm not here to tell the Adelaide City Council what to do, but I have asked every minister to look at every line of expenditure and whether any of it can be brought forward now, not in 12 months time or so. I don't, we don't need, uh, uh, since we made our $350 million announcement, I've had every project uh, possible, new tennis centres, new, you know, don't, it's all great, but you've got to go out for six, 12 or, you know, in some cases, 15 year public consultations. Uh, this is not a stimulus activity. In fact, it's just a, this is soul destroying, quite frankly. So, uh, what we need to focus on are those things that we can bring forward immediately, and um, I think that that's really important. My, if I was to offer any advice to the Adelaide City Council, I would say it's really important for our leaders to be calm and considered. It's really important for us to have single messaging. It's really important, as annoying as it might be, and as unnecessary as it potentially is right now, for you as the leaders not to be shaking hands, not to be flippant about this. It is really serious. You will actually save lives by having, uh, by inspiring public confidence not to treat this as something that everybody can get over. All of you, if you're infected with the coronavirus uh, now, would get over it. I have absolutely, unless there's something about your medical history that I don't understand, you would all get over it. And it could take you four days, it could take you four weeks, but you would all get over it. You're in some ways not the ones that we're concerned about, but it's your parents and your grandparents, it's people that you might visit in the community who have much greater health fragility. We've got to be very, very concerned about those. And again, if somebody in one of those cohorts at the moment was struck with this virus, we have the capacity to deal with it. We just don't have the capacity to deal with 10,000 of them next Thursday at four o'clock. And that's why our number one focus is just on a con con containing the spread of this virus for as long as we can. We cannot avoid it. These idiotic concepts that you hear uh, on talkback radio and on the Twitter sphere, all we need to do is to close down the schools for two weeks. I mean, it's inane. What do you do at the end of the two weeks? Do you reopen them? I mean, it just, it, it, you know, we have to, at these times, listen to experts. And I'm quite convinced with the establishment of the National Cabinet, the AHPPC, the CDNA, uh, and the C, uh, the um, National Coordinating Mechanism, the NCM, um, that we are we really have got the very best evidence-based advice to those groups, and it's not helpful for people that have got no training or somebody that's you know met a paediatrician uh, that says that this is what they're going to do with their kids. It's not helpful to be exacerbating the panic 
Uh, it's really easy to do. If somebody decides they don't want their kids to go to school, that's their decision. But we can really only make decisions based upon the evidence and the evidence, and I will deal with schooling for a second, but the evidence on schooling is overwhelmingly that children must remain in school at the moment and that we will be on, on all of the models that are created and all of the evidence as we've deal, dealt with different epidemics in the past and what we're dealing with and recognising other jurisdictions at the moment, the kids go out, they get it far easier than when they're at school and then they spread it and they often spread it to the most vulnerable cohorts. Can I also just touch on something that we're definitely going to need a uh, high level of leadership support for and that's around aged care. Um, this is something that the federal government, uh, sorry, the, the national cabinet will be looking at and seeking advice on. It's quite possible that more strict controls around visitation to aged care facilities will be put in place sooner rather than later. This will be met with mixed reactions. Some people will be aghast at the fact that they're being told that they can't go and visit their mother four times a day. Um, look, we have to make tough decisions during uh, these times. If you look at the five deaths that have occurred in Australia at the moment, three of them have been in one aged care facility in New South Wales. We cannot be responsible for accelerating uh, increased uh, mortalities from this disease because we haven't adopted the best uh, advice. And so I'm just sort of appealing to people in leadership roles to you know, try to get on board, uh, understand that we're not making ill-informed political decisions. We've, um, by establishing the national cabinet, we've eliminated the um, the attraction for premiers to enter into an auction of who can be the toughest on the virus. It's not helpful when premiers go out and say we're stockpiling medicines in Queens. Not helpful at all. Uh, and so we're now acting in a coordinated way. And the more we do that across the entire leadership in South Australia, the better outcomes we're going to have for our population. Premier, are you okay for a little bit longer? Yes. So Councillor Hyde and Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran. Thank you, Premier, for coming. I'll just get back to the question you just talked about. What is our capacity now and what will be our capacity to deal with the patients in four to six weeks' time? So at the moment, we have five and a half thousand or thereabouts hospital beds in South Australia, but some of them are general beds and some of them are aged care beds in country hospitals. And we need to really make sure that we can meet that peak demand. We don't know exactly when that peak demand is going to occur or exactly and precisely what it's going to be, but the best statisticians and logisticians that exist in the country are working on that based upon this expert input from the World Health Organization and the spread of the disease uh, to date. What we do know is that we need to significantly increase the number of ICU beds and critical care beds in South Australia and also deal with ventilators and ECMO. And this ECMO facility, which I think is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation capability, is what we need urgently in South Australia. And the longer that we can delay this, the more of this capability that we can get into South Australia to make sure that we can uh, treat as many people with the appropriate level of care. It doesn't mean that everybody will come through this unscathed. As you'd probably be more than aware, people die of the flu every uh, year, um, and, and, and that's going to happen. But we don't want people dying in South Australia because they haven't been able to get the appropriate ICU um, support or uh, ventilator access. And that's why it was important to put in this public emergency declaration on the weekend, because then I can just go and get uh, what I want. So um, all I can say uh, is um, lots of work uh, looking at our existing capacity within our hospitals. And I don't want to be making announcements at the Adelaide City Council tonight. We are thinking well beyond our own five and a half thousand beds and, and, and standing up facilities and requisitioning capacity as and when they're needed. But going back to point three in our plan, we want to have high level public uh, education and awareness, but we don't, and we're doing that to inspire public confidence, not to undermine public confidence by announcing things uh, that will sort of unsettle the horses. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes. Mayor, we've got a, a fairly large number of homeless people sleeping in our streets. Um, is there a plan to um, house them or look after them during this? So one of the things that we've already announced is that we would have free 
flu vaccinations because we don't want that comorbidity issue hitting that really vulnerable uh, community. But there is work that at the moment Michelle Lensink is doing, again, in a national coordinated way regarding those cohorts which are particularly vulnerable, and that is definitely one of them. Uh, homeless people and remote Indigenous groups have got you know, hugely fragile um, health profiles. I don't know whether Dr. Cusack would like to comment on that as well, but they're very, very fragile. They're in those cohorts that we will be, will be dealing with. Yeah, I think just to reiterate those points that we are targeting those both through NGOs and through SA Health itself to, to sort of build plans that we can act quickly and ideally sooner than later um, that, would, that would support um, homeless and, and Indigenous groups. In respect to Indigenous, there are, there are already um, arrangements being, being sort of put in place to um, isolate communities and so forth to ensure that the disease doesn't get in in the first place. Um, because obviously worried to do so could be more challenging to just one follow-up question just just on that though can i just say that we've already put in place additional restrictions to enter onto the apy lands yeah. um so now even for a member of parliament where we are meant to have um, unfettered access onto the ap wirelands we need to provide statutory declarations of any uh, travel that would increase our risk profile so those things as soon as we've been made aware that there's a requirement for them we've acted very very quickly i suppose my question really is i mean the ap wirelands obviously your government you deal with that um is more the the man that's sleeping 100 yards down there in his own urine uh, are you going to go and give him a fuel injection um, Councillor Moran, we've also got in our presentation as to what the council's doing, we've got some information directly on that as well. I, I can get more information on exactly how the, I don't know how the administration of those free flu vaccinations is going to work, but I can find out and get back. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Premier. I really appreciate you making time to come and uh, talk to the City Council tonight. I think that's quite extraordinary. I know that um, other states aren't getting as much respect as you've shown us this evening. So uh, thank you for your time and the information. And Dr Cusack, thank you for joining us. Um, we will um, continue to stay in touch with uh, state and federal and uh, hopefully we'll work together for, to contain this very quickly. Thank you very much. And look, if there's another requirement for us to come back, this is a quickly changing situation. If I hadn't given this presentation last week, it would have been completely different from what I'm providing today and it will be completely different next week as well. So it's really important that we, we rely on the most up-to-date information. And if there is a requirement for another special council meeting and you'd like me to come along and address, I'm more than happy to do so. Or if you are involved with other organisations that you think would benefit, um, from understanding what the state plan and the state response is, don't hesitate to let me know because 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I think this is a complete write-up. I don't think I'll be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but this is a real time for us to have this calm, uh, informed uh, thinking about this and uh, informed decision-making at the national level. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, members. Um, we'll now actually um, go to the CEO. So we've got a presentation so that you can understand what the response has been uh, in terms of our own internal staff and governments. So, CEO. Yeah, thanks, Lord Mayor. Just uh, for the benefit of council members, just need to advise that the Lord Mayor and I have been communicating frequently as this um, situation has evolved. And from a City of Adelaide perspective, I guess there are two different areas of response that we've got underway at the moment. Uh, first of all, there is the community community response, which is the executive team and yourselves as council members. Um, and then also, secondly, there's the organisational response, um, which is through our incident management team, which Vanessa is going to explain shortly, um, and, uh, and the executive team working together. So those two different areas of response are being progressed. Um, we are working within what we call an emergency management incident, a critical incident framework, and uh, that's a documented framework that we have, and we'll talk about that. Um, and a lot of work has been undertaken in the, in the past month, and um, in broad terms, it's our intention to um, maintain business as usual for as long as circumstances permit as an organisation. And um, however, it's likely that we are going to enter a period where business as usual may not be possible. And, and when that occurs, we will, of course, maintain critical council services. Um, 
we, as you know, have a duty of care for the um, for staff well-being and um, and uh, and resourcing. So I'm going to be working with the executive and with yourselves to address any issues for the community, our businesses, and for visitors. Um, as, as the Premier was saying, a really common sense approach and calm leadership is needed. And tonight you're gonna to hear our approach to that. Uh, first of all, you get a status update from Vanessa, um, a business support update from Ian, and then a community support update from Claire. Uh, and then we're gonna to look to a, towards a recommendation that you may consider um, that's gonna authorise the administration to undertake necessary actions on behalf of you as council members. Um, I can confirm that operationally there's been a lot of work undertaken, a lot of preparatory work, and this work has been led largely by Vanessa, who's been appointed as uh, the Council Commander for the Incident Response. Uh, so we're calling her Command Commander um, Godden. So um, she's doing a great job in that regard and doing a, a lot of work with the team. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to, to Vanessa and she can work us through. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, thanks, Mark, and through you, Chair. Um, as Mark said, we um, have enacted our in critical incident management team in response to the COVID-19 um, coronavirus. Um, so I'll just walk you through um, where we're up to. Um, just in terms of the, the context of in which we're operating, um, we have an emergency management framework here at the City of Adelaide um, and it follows the principles that are adopted in the Emergency Management Act, um, which are known as prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. We're well and truly in the response phase at the moment um, and as the Premier said, with a primary objective to contain um, the spread of the virus. What that means in terms of the City of Adelaide context where um, we have various escalation levels depending on the type of incident within our um, framework. We're at a level two incident at the moment, which is defined in our framework as a critical incident. And that's when we um, um, appoint a, a council commander internally to help facilitate that. Um, and a level two incident is one that really has the potential to impact more broadly than what would be ordinarily within our um, sphere of, sort of leadership in leadership influence. Um, a level three incident is when a state emergency is declared. You will have heard the Premier declare that it's a public health emergency, the coronavirus. Um, but that's slightly different to um, a state emergency under the Emergency Services Act. So um, we're still working within a level two incident. But what the public health emergency declaration does do is provide us within the council with powers to enforce under the Public Health Act and we have officers that are delegated to do that. Um, essentially the role of the council commander in managing an incident like this is to call together um, a council incident management team and I have the delegation or the council commander has the delegation to um, deploy resources um, in response to managing the incident. Um, so these are the resources that we're drawing upon in terms of um, how we're managing it. So we have the City of Adelaide Emergency Management Plan, we have operations manuals, business continuity plans, work, workplace emergency evacuation plans, IT disaster recovery plans and community recovery operations manual. And I guess I'm just sharing this with you um, to provide you with a level of comfort and reassurance that um, we do have a lot of um, frameworks and governance in place to help us work through this particular incident. And obviously we're also taking our advice from the lead agencies in relation to this particular incident, Federal Department of Health, State Government, etc. We're working closely with our Capital City Council, so we meet with them regularly. Um, that has been weekly, but that's escalating to higher frequency now. We're part of an LGA working group, and we also have an LGA HR network that's working through some of the staffing and resourcing implications to make sure that we're um, providing a consistent approach across the sector. Um, this is what the council incident management team looks like. So we have the council commander, which is me, 
We have a full-time incident management support officer, there's a communications officer, and then various advisors that sit on that incident management team from everything from corporate governance and risk right through to finance and procurement and everything in between. Um, and we're very fortunate at the City of Adelaide to have um, you know, very capable professional experts in all of those fields um, who are able to provide advice. Um, in terms of the roles and responsibilities, so the incident management team is responsible for managing the incident and the executive leadership team is in charge of business as usual and the business continuity plans and managing communications to members. Um, so what we have been meeting um, weekly, we're now meeting daily. So the incident management team meets at three o'clock every day and updates the executive team at four. And as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, she'll be in a position to update members after five o'clock every day. So um, we, we weren't needing to meet that frequently before, but as the Premier said, this is an ever-changing environment and so we're needing to be very agile and move quickly. Um, our response to date, um, I've talked about the fact that we've pulled a team together. Um, we've also created a generic email for staff. We, as you can imagine, we're receiving a lot of questions. Um, we're sending those to a centralised inbox that the incident management team is monitoring um, hourly and we're responding to those as, as well as incorporating any of those questions and concerns into our um, communications with all staff. Um, and our priority focus to date has been on the safety and health of our people. Um, obviously, our emerging priorities are updating and refreshing everyone with our business continuity plan. So that happened today. We did um, a concerted effort with all of the leaders meeting today to review their business continuity plans with a review to um, uh, revising what we believe to be the critical services that we would need to provide um, to the community and the resourcing that's required to deliver that. Um, and that's obviously in the event of us needing to um, change the services that we're providing, which today we haven't needed to do. Um, we're also um, doing some scenario planning, um, short, medium and longer term scenario planning around things like staffing, um, service continuity, financial revenue loss, procurement and supply chain issues. And we're also starting to work through what business and community support will look like, both, both during the containment phase, which may be prolonged, as well as we move into the recovery phase. And I'll just hand over to Ian and Claire to talk you through those points. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, Ian? Thanks through the chair. Um, just got a bit of a highlight here of one slide. I'm just going to talk you through um, some work we've done. I just want to acknowledge to the hard work of Vanessa and the team. The last couple of weeks, it's been moving incredibly quickly. Um, so we've set up our BCP around the business continuity, for, particularly for the business sector. That's again been thoroughly reviewed in the last sort of 48, 24 hours. Again, that continues to move at pace. Um, we've got a range of levers that we're exploring at the moment. I've just put up a few here I will talk to. But there are things we have existing rate hardship provisions where we do have the ability to look at alleviating some of the uh, cost implications for rate payers um, who are suffering some hardship. We've got short term financial levers, um, things like payment terms of council are things that we could look at, whether we shorten those payment terms, because I think as, you, as you've heard, cash flow will be critical. Cash flow will be critical in terms of keeping these businesses going through, through this period. Um, so we do have a range of mechanisms that we could look at uh, waiving fees or, or um, delaying or prolonging or extending periods of payment or us ourselves paying more quickly to help cash flow. So there are probably some simple things that we can do, um, which we're working through at the moment. Um, Business SA, you probably saw today, uh, Mark and myself met with the CEO of Business SA last week. Um, with the knowledge that they were about to announce um, a whole range of free workshops to members and non-members, which I think is really important. They will run as many of those workshops as the, as the market dictates to help with issues around um, resilience, cash flows, employment obligations, workers' rights, all those things that are about business survival. Um, we've also asked them for a proposal to us to see if there's anything that we can do over and above for the CBD. Um, I think we're conscious of the importance of the CBD, not just to, to our, this group, but also the wider state. 
um, healthy heart and healthy arteries argument. Um, so we're looking, we'll look at that when that arrives in terms of anything over and above what businesses say are currently doing. We're also working with the Australian China Business Council. They're running a range of free workshops too to help with particular businesses with particular needs. Um, the mobile aid initiative that we spoke about, I emailed now the other week, it's probably one now that we are going to hit pause on for a second and keep working up all the, the platform and keep working up um, the creative and the execution of this campaign when it is ready, when the time is right. Um, so in some ways we've prepared one earlier um, and we'll look to roll it out when the, when the timing and the market conditions um, reflect the need for it. Um, I think at this moment obviously the priority is on health, wellbeing uh, and therefore rolling out that type of campaign right here, right now probably isn't the right message, but we will be prepared um, when we get through it all. And I think the Premier touched on this a little bit too. He talked about infrastructure and types of investments that we should be looking to bring forward. So I've had some initial conversations at executive level about what some of those projects could look like, um, whether they have a construction phase to them. Um, they could be digital infrastructure, for example. It could be something like the Adelaide Free Wi-Fi, which does require an upgrade. The single largest export of South Australia now is international education, higher than mining, higher than agriculture. Um, if we were to upgrade all of our uh, Adelaide free Wi-Fi, it would probably take a, a four to six month rollout. So consideration of that decision now to invest in something when Corona has hopefully uh, washed through the system would make us uh, far more appealing to international students because they are the highest users of, of free Wi-Fi. So it's those sorts of things we are thinking about from an investment point of view. Um, again, my role is to look at a bit of the pipeline, a bit of post, post this event. What should we be doing now? So there are some things like event funding that we could look at. Again, I'm conscious that this would happen later on, um, but we currently invest about $1.8 million into invest into events and festivals. They drive footfall and foot traffic. Um, again, when the time's right and the industry is looking for those things, um, we're oversubscribed significantly there. So we're looking at whether we, we seek some further additional dollars to help drive those sorts of things, working with precinct groups, whether we do some things to help them activate within their precincts. But again, working through all those details, but it's about the right measure at the right time um, as we go through um, what is unprecedented uh, activity around interruption to the business community. Thank you, uh, Ian. Um, and over to Claire. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so in terms of community support, um, as already indicated by the Premier and as we're acutely aware, the focus and priority um, from our perspective is on supporting those who are in a more vulnerable position than the broader community. Um, so we obviously through our Commonwealth Health Support Programme um, have some clients here in the city, either elderly or disabled, and who may have pre-existing conditions. Um, so the focus is on making sure that we contact them and make sure that they have what they need. Um, in terms of the rough sleepers, so we know at the moment there are 151 in the city, and you know, on top of the flu shots that they'll be receiving in the coming days, um, there's actually a meeting scheduled tomorrow with service providers uh, to talk about how to better coordinate a response to ensure rough sleepers um, who are in a vulnerable position um, are cared for in the coming weeks. And staff are also um, communicating with um, resident groups and community members through existing channels and networks, so to make sure that um, there's up to date information shared as and when we have it with those that need it. Um, in the past couple of years, we've focused on uh, community resilient leaders programs, so good timing. We now have 70 members of the community trained to provide support in emergencies. So while we haven't activated anything at this point, um, in the coming weeks we can certainly look at um, engaging these resilience leaders to do some work on the ground. Um, as I've already mentioned, our CHISOP client is roughly 160, so perhaps we could do some practical support. Um, we can also identify other elderly residents. Um, the team has already come up with a campaign around my street um, and looking at ways in which to um, activate people on the street who are well and healthy to reach out to those that might need an additional support. Um, and also, you know, think about things around um, how um, People can move around the city, collect what they need, and then take that back to those that need it. So ideas like that aren't underway. Sorry, the ideas are underway. We haven't triggered those yet, but we'll certainly be ready in the coming weeks if we need to. 
So in terms of our community and recreational facilities, so as the Premier has indicated, there's like to be some change around um, event numbers, um, but at the moment obviously um, anything um, 500 and above has been cancelled this week. Um, so should social distancing be mandated, we'll be looking to be ready to close our library facilities, community centres and recreational uh, facilities and you might be aware that Melbourne took that decision today. Um, at the moment we haven't, we're working through what that could mean um, so that we're ready to um, if required. Um, in the last couple of years we've had a huge explosion in uh, digital library services so we have about 700,000 people signed up to our digital library services so we need to make Make sure that um, that's accessible and can be maintained um, and in terms of our recreational facilities we're just reviewing some membership uh, needs and requirements to make sure that um, how we manage that in the coming weeks um, is fair and equitable so those are types of things that we're um, planning in the coming days. Thank you. Um, members, all open for questions. Um, Councillor Sims, I saw your hand up. Thanks, Lord Mayor, and um, thanks very much, everybody, for all your um, presentations. Two questions. Um, one around uh, staffing. If we do move down the territory of having to close down some of the services, like the library, for instance, um, what support will be provided to staff, in particular, I guess, casual staff that maybe find themselves um, going through long periods of time where they're not getting an income? Could I get some advice on that? Three, Lord Mayor. Um, we're aware of the potential impacts on our workforce generally, and in, in particular, our casual workforce. And you're right, the, the aquatic centre, the libraries um, certainly have a significant number of casual employees in those areas. Uh, we're currently um, considering our casual workforce plus also our general workforce and looking at a range of different uh, matters that we need to address. Um, with regard to our casuals, we're gathering information on the numbers, roles, functions. And um, what I'm looking to do is have you providing you with information as we progress through this matter uh, regarding a whole range of staffing issues and certainly casuals, a casual workforce is one that we need to have careful consideration. Thank you. Um, the other question I wanted to ask about is, understand we're mandated to meet once a month, but what would happen if there's a situation where council itself can't physically meet? And is that something that we've had um, advice on? Um, I'm, actually, I might answer that, CEO. So I'm not sure if everybody got the circular from Kelly Jones today. If not, I can happily circulate that. So essentially, um, it talks to uh, discretionary powers to alter meeting dates and to how we meet, um, even in terms of members participating by remote access. So we're just working through that at the moment. This has been presented to the Minister and has been um, driven through it, you know, in terms of interpretation of local government. Oh, great. So just to clarify, would that require state government legislation or it could be an internal interpretation? My understanding is an interpretation. CEO, did you want to? Yeah, three well, it is just that as an internal interpret interpretation. However, the LGA has a meeting scheduled for tomorrow and this will be one of those matters that we discuss from a sector point of view, um, which I think would be a good way forward. Thank you. Um, I might recirculate that to make sure everybody's got a copy because it's quite clear information. Um, members, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Martin? Um, yeah, just in relation to facilities, and I'll broaden that to include the Aquatic Centre as a, a community facility. Um, th there is clearly a government intention at some stage, as the Premier foreshadowed, to uh, restrict public gatherings greater than 50 people. Uh, does our decision to close facilities such as libraries and the aquatic centre depend on that decision of government or do we act separately and independently? So Claire, did you want to answer that? I can, I can answer from here, but did you want to? Um, we don't need to wait um, for uh, state or federal um, directions um, and as the Premier's indicated um, you know if um, councils or um, other organisations wish to go it alone based on their own uh, community needs then um, that's absolutely fine um, however um, we are going through um, some um, 
deeper analysis on the capacity um, of our essential services to be delivered in different ways. So we probably need 24 more hours to better understand what that landscape looks like to enable us to make some decisions around um, which of our facilities may or may not be, be closed. Yeah. And just as a brief question, given there's a cleaning regimen that's been increased on public transport, we'll do the same with our facilities. Yes, that's, I think, sorry, Vanessa, would you like to answer that? Um, through, through you, Lord Mayor, um, yeah, that's, there's a number of things that we're, we're working through with, with the council incident management team, including um, the need to increase cleaning regimes, both in our workplaces and in the public realm. So that all of those things are on the agenda, but um, again, we just probably need 20, hours. yeah, we, we really only enacted all of those things um, at speed this morning. Okay, and just one other thing, uh, on Tuesday of last week, we approved a, a budget for advertising and promotion for my travel, which is aimed at bringing people to the city, encouraging them to attend. My Adelaide, my Adelaide. My Adelaide, my Adelaide yes. sorry. That um, was the one that um, Director Hill just referred to. So is that now suspended? We are going to, uh, in fact, discourage people from large gatherings? Um, Director. So, sorry, through the Lord Mayor, um, as I said before, the My Adelaide initiative is, is in the can, we're holding it. It's actually a redirect, so it's not new money, it's a redirect of some existing resources in uh, ECODEV. Um, and it isn't necessarily targeted at, at, wasn't necessarily targeted at mass gatherings, it was more about uh, discovering your CBD, shopping in the CBD and trying to stimulate some demand. But we have definitely put that on hold until the timing is right. Okay. So that's on hold, that's good. Councillor Sims, did you have another question? Just um, something to put on your radar. Um, Ian, I asked the Premier about it earlier around the anti-racism yes. campaign. Um, I think that would be something for us to maybe consider as well, because I have heard um, regrettably that there has been a spike of uh, racially motivated verbal incidents and so on, um, racism happening on um, city streets. I think that's really concerning. So if there's something we can do to address that, maybe as part of our own marketing approach, you know, encouraging community harmony and so on at this time, I think it'd be really beneficial. Councillor Martin. Yeah, one final quick question. Has the City of Adelaide had a staff member identified as uh, or diagnosed as uh, having COVID-19 or been in contact with anyone with COVID-19? Sorry. Um, through the Chair, we're not aware of anybody that has been confirmed with COVID-19 um, in the City of Adelaide. And what about staff being in touch with anyone who has suspected COVID-19? Uh, we're not aware of that either at this stage, but we are keeping, so we're asking all staff to um, to provide us with, well, with the information if they have been travelling. So, and obviously um, the Prime Minister made an announcement yesterday to, for people to self-isolate after they've returned from travel. So we've instigated that and we're starting to build a register of people who are currently away. Um, and we're, yeah, it, that's a moving um, feast. Sort no, of that's hourly fine. Day. So no one's been instructed to go home or quarantine themselves at No, all. there's nobody that's been diagnosed. Not that, no, no, not diagnosed. Quarantine because of suspicions no. of not that we're aware of it Thank as you. we sit here. Members, if there's no other questions. Uh, if there's no other questions, then um, the formal meeting procedures will now be applied. Sorry, Councillor Ho. Well, Lai well, I don't have any questions, but just like to share some of the comments, if possible. Okay, we'll stay in, uh, we'll st we won't go back into formal meeting procedures until you finish. Okay, all right, thank you. <coughs> well, members, like, I think I've got quite a few stories i like to share as well as the comments because really, like, I started to deal with this very much from late January. Uh, I have been working very close with the local Chinese community that who have a lot of fears over the last couple of months or two months or three months, whatsoever. Firstly, I'd like to ask a question though, I mean, because like the lesson I have learned the first lesson I have learned is the information, whether or not we will be able to find a single source of truth that people, either our staff or the people in the community can really get the truth, get the correct information for our, from our government bodies. Not just the true information or the correct information, but also 
the information with the date on it. Because over the last six weeks, we have received so many different guidelines. They almost change on a daily basis, especially from the day from 27th of January up until the 15th of February. <coughs> the guidelines almost change on a daily basis. So that is the first lesson I have learned. And also in terms of like helping, helping our local business here, well, I have been working with a lot of the rest, local restaurants, especially the restaurants in Chinatown, as the as the media reported like about a month ago or six weeks ago, their sales has reduced around 80%. And a lot of those businesses have closed. And somehow I have learned some very good things for, from some of the business that instead of encourage people to come to their restaurant to eat, they actually start to sell it online. They actually start to make, like, say, a set menu, say, 50 bucks for a few dishes, and they deliver it to your home. Instead of instead of shut down the restaurant, they actually put some online sales and promote it quite nicely. Indeed, like, just just use it as an example, like the, the the restaurant called Star House, and they are, they are dealing with a lot of seafood. And especially now the lobsters are very cheap, so they start to make some lobster set menus. And indeed, they their their sales have reduced about eighty percent when we first heard about the coronavirus stuff. And now they're almost back to normal. Even though you haven't seen any customers in the restaurant, but their sales are still very good. Hence, they can keep all their stuff in the, in the kitchen, and all and other casual stuff instead of coming coming to serve the dishes as a waiter, they become delivered drivers. All right. And and that is something I mean I have found that very interesting and I start to encourage other restaurant owner restaurants owners to do the same. Instead of provide a full menu, they start to provide some kind of very simple set menus. And that will that, that will help those people to pick up, I mean, kind of like pick up. The, I mean, of course, they're not going to make a lot of money out of it, but at least they could keep the they could keep their full time staff. Mm -hmm. They could keep their full time staff and keep the business up and running, and that's very important in such difficult time. All right. And besides that, I have got a lot more other stories to share. But in terms of like, I mean, I like to ask the administration whether or not you have already got enough resource if somehow the staff need it. I, I mean, like say, face mask, hand sanitizer, and a lot of other things. Whether or not you have got it in place. Um, yes, through the Lord Mayor, we do have enough of all of that. We've been quite prepared for a while. So, yes, is the answer. Well, thank you for sharing the, those stories, Councillor. Uh, no, yeah, just one more thing. Into oh, <laughs> yeah. We've got a motion now. Yep, we do. We've done for an hour. Could you tell us your stories? One one. I'm happy to give. Well, I mean, it is indeed like in related to the motion I have moved on last Tuesday about the My Athlete Initiative. I was about to talk. I mean, ask whether or not the I mean I can actually investigate. Sort of like you were talking about running some kind of workshops with ACBC, right, to help people from different industries to pick up. I mean, to kind of like survive in such a difficult time. And whether or not you will be able to, whether or not you will be able to work with ACBC on from I mean, for different in the, from different industries and learn from those good stories, work out some plans for them and try to run run those workshop and put it in a video, put it on YouTube. Hence, people from different industries can actually get on YouTube and learn from those stories. Hence, they might be able to work out some solutions for their own business to survive at this moment. Thank you, Councillor. That's all I'd like to say, Councillor. Mm -hmm. Just really quickly, back through the chair. Um, absolutely, we're working with the ACBC, including some online uh, training workshops, which they are providing, and we are going to help distribute. So uh, we're very much down that path. Councillor Karen. Thanks, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, if we're allowing comment, I'll, um, I'll keep it brief. Um, the I, th I think it's important that we rec well. This is as much an economic crisis as a health one, uh, and arguably it's a, it's a bigger economic crisis than a health one because the health outcomes from the economic problems will be will be are not good. Um, but this is not a criticism of anyone, uh, but I think it's important we look at the context of 
uh, the lead up to this current situation. Um, in, in my view, uh, some of our messaging in the lead up to this to the current period has been um, has has uh, had issues. Uh, so, for example, we had. Uh, not too long ago, we were presented with a discussion paper uh, that said um, uh, uh, we were, were going to have a discussion paper about transport options. We then had a headline the next day that said uh, City Council considering a zero car strategy. Um, much more recently, back at the last meeting, uh, we had a, uh, a motion and then a subsequent headline uh, that said uh, the City Council is considering a zero waste strategy, which may cost millions of dollars. Now, I mention this because if you are a business in the city and you are coming up to the juncture of a five-year lease and you are considering whether you are going to renew your five-year lease, uh, there's every chance you're going to look at this sort of messaging and say, forget it, uh, it's all too much. This stuff, um, uh, you know, this stuff just doesn't help at all. I'm not going to renew the lease. Um, in my view, we have to think very clearly about what would send the right message to countervail some of those issues. Um, I think one of the, the best things we could contemplate right now is an emergency rate cut, um, an emergency rate cut for uh, effective for the current quarter or whatever, whichever rates notice is, is, is currently pending. Uh, so a 10, 20, 30% rate cut. And I think that's the kind of thing that would set a very clear signal to the business community that we are actually listening. Um, I don't think any amount of advertising at this juncture is going to make any difference. I think that's the sort of thing that will only help down the track once people have a sense they can come back. At the moment, the problem is discretionary income and the problem is the capacity of businesses to meet, uh, to meet their rate payments. Councillor Simmons. Yeah, I'll leave the politicking for another meeting. Um, but I just wanted to feed in, I think we'd all agree in terms of providing support to business, but I just wanted to also um, flag the importance of providing support to the arts sector as well, which is a big part of our local economy, as we all know, and it's going to be really hard hit by this. So if we're going to be having discussions, I think that's important in terms of obviously that leads on to um, our businesses as well, but it's a huge part of our local economy. So we need to include that in the discussion as well as the vulnerable residents too, that are going to be really hard here. Thank you. Um, councillors, Councillor just, 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 just a quick question. I know that um, we mentioned uh, um, liaising with our precinct groups. Are we doing the same thing with our subsidiaries as well? So RMA and ACMA as well? Um, yes, at a board meeting this morning. Got another one on Thursday, um, and working really closely with both Jody and Joe Williams. And Joe's here tonight. No worries. Um, Lord Mayor, I'll have to excuse myself uh, fairly soon, but I just wanted to acknowledge and thank administration for their um, uh, very uh, good response and communication that we've had so far in relation to this matter. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moran. Uh, just look, I'm all for rate cuts, but. Um, uh, it seems that some councils forget our residents all the time, which make up a vast number of um, And also, as we get often told about, they don't give much in the rate revenue, so giving them a rate reduction would be less painful. So I think we should talk about all our rate payers. As Simon has ably explained, good businesses can adjust and find other ways, but when you're staying home because you can't go to work and you're and uh, you, you're privately employed, um, you, you're on no income. So um, I think we should stop talking about businesses and include all our stakeholders. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I think from the presentations, you can clearly see that the administration is looking at three parts. We're looking at our own staff and our own responsibility in terms of health, safety and wellbeing. We're looking at the residents and the communities and those that aren't able to get help, including those that are sleeping rough and our aged care yeah, or aged... response there. I mean, going and rousing the poor man sleeping naked and injections isn't, isn't really going to oh, there's, there's more work than that. There is actually more work than that's too. happening. That's and the other thing I wanted to mention, just reading some of the health things, uh, bottom of shoes um, can spread COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And walking down in Winchester, as I do every day, it is filthy with vomit and urine quite every day, and people are walking through it. So could we up our cleaning, particularly it's only that yeah. bit of street, really? Yeah, I think they've already got things in place to up yeah. the cleaning regime. Well, that's that's period. in place today, yeah. I don't even try. Members, I am going to go back into formal. Um,
I circulated a recommendation earlier to all members. I'm happy to move it. Sorry, Councillor Moran, Deputy Lord Mayor to second. Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, no, I did not. I would address the issue well and that's a uh, good general motion to take us on to the next step. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor, members. Um, so if not, I will actually go to the move to sum up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, too will, quick. Will we, will, will, will we get a rate kind of considered as part of this? Uh, we will be bringing back the measures that are being undertaken and that doesn't necessarily look at a rate cut. We actually discussed already the things that we would be looking at in terms of payment plans um, and what uh, fees and uh, permits and things like that that we can actually look at. Um, that may have to come in separately, uh, so this, Councillor. In this instance, you're closing off a rate cut from this. I think that requires a further discussion and we would actually... Three will then. This is an enabling motion. An enabling motion, and there are a whole lot of financial considerations that we need to put into place. So, certainly, listening to you today, we understand that may be a requirement or a desire, but um, we need to bring a measured response back to you. This enables us to do just that. Yeah, I'm happy to move it at uh, the next meeting that we consider back across the board. But at the moment, I have actually summed up all the minutes. Yes, you have. Uh, members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Uh, Councillor Kerry? Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm poor. Thank you. Uh, that is carried. Uh, members, just reiterating that we will send comms out uh, around five o'clock each day after the meetings have been held. Um, and uh, I hope everybody, if they're feeling well, is out and about. Don't forget to sanitise and uh, uh, we keep calm and still actually enjoy our city and carry on. Thank you very much for meeting again at short notice. I declare the meeting closed.